Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, I just would like to continue uh, with what Diego done on the uh, high-rise building on the technical aspects. I just now would like to move on to the construction side, what we would normally face, the problems to achieve uh, or what to when, when we transfer the design concept into the, uh, onto the site and uh, just try to uh, look at what we are going to do. It. I just want to briefly uh, look at the uh, three uh, basic aspects of the post-tensioning, the installation, stressing, and grouting, and then just to go into the projects and real time what the problems we have faced it. On the grouting, I have touched it here, is the majority of the projects we do it in, in, in the UK uh, using the bonded post-tension system rather than unbonded. In the case of unbonded, you don't need that, that third aspect of the work. Now, I just would like to uh, take you through in the installation. So there are some certain important uh, uh, steps need to follow. Otherwise, you may end up in some, something missing at the middle. Just get it something straight away. The first one is the uh, need to have a deck control sheet. This is to prevent any accidents or the health and safety reasons. Uh, you need to make sure, you know, there are no loopholes on the formworks. You know, they, they, these are possible uh, areas where when you use the precast element the, oh, and the different shape of the vertical elements, you may miss some of the formwork at the time, but the people may be already on the top. Uh, so the supervisors are advised to check that one first and sign it off, the first document. And also then the, for the working and the stressing and all purposes, the perimeter around a meter is advisable to have so that people can walk onto it. And the first, they will do it after get into the deck, they'll use this, they will get these strands on top of it. Uh, there, there are a few things need to take into account when they bring it, use the, uh, uh, the it's, it's not advisable to use the chains rather than use these straps, because if you use chains, you know, you will damage at the top and bottom of the corner. And also you will have a dispenser for that to release the strands and to be installed. You will put it into the dispenser and after putting that, then cut the uh, safety straps on it, otherwise it will open up. Uh, then on the, then when, you, when you leave that the uh, strand coil, this is about, co uh, about weighs three and a half tons in a, about a meter square area, so the sub, that the formwork should support sufficiently. So you have to identify, as a designer, have to identify where you want to put it up those coils and, you know, possibly closer to the large supports and or, or in other option, normally on the formwork, you stiffen the supports underneath. So this is again need to take into account where you want to place it. And also you have to look at where you want to install, which direction you are going to install the strands so that you can uh, pull out the strands in, uh, uh, where you want it. And then, the, then you, will, you will fix the anchors onto the deck, so you will mark the position first on the formwork, and then you drill the holes and fix the anchors uh, with a polyform in front of it. Uh, then the next one would be the duct installation. I try to get, take it quickly through because this is one of the fundamental things, so I don't want to take more time. Uh, this is the ducts, you know, you will install the ducts for the bonded tendons, so strands will go through it. You, have, you normally have 70 millimeters or 90 millimeter width of the duct. The depth is about 20 to 19 millimeters for a, a strand of 15.7 millimeter in diameter. So you will, uh, cut, you will install in a straight line first and you cut it, you connect it by with a coupler on it. The steel itself, it can, the duct itself can open up at the end, so you will connect it that one. Then where you want it, you will cut it up on it. Then the installation of the strands, these strands could be done in two ways. You can push it either mechanically using an uh, equipment, electri electrical equipment, or you can do it manually. When you use an electrical equipment, you have to be careful that the length, because that runs the strands, pull out the strands quite quickly. So if you have a long tendon, then you use the, uh, the mechanical equipment uh, so that when you install it, you have to be next to the uh, machine one person, the other person should be at the end, so you had to say when it comes to the right end, you had to stop it. Uh, whereas, uh, whereas when you do the, uh, the, the manual installation, it's for the normally for the short tendons you will do it, short and say five to 10, or say about 10 meters or 15 meters max. So that require more labor to install it, but you have to be careful while you are installing because uh, that, that strand when you pre-cut or anything, it may be when you cut it some way, it may just open up outside. So safety, health and safety need to take into account. 
Then the other one, once you install these strands, you will prepare, if it is a single end stressing, then the other end you have to uh, make it as a dead end, which should sufficiently hold the force, but you are going to stress it on the other side. Because the duct is empty, when you stress it, the strand will be pulled through, so this should be bonded sufficiently. But if you really look at a standard bonded length with a bare strand, like a 15.7, it's like B16 bars, then you may end up two meters or two and a half meters length to hold that force. If we do that, then that two and a half meters or two meter plus is ineffective region. So therefore, we try to form a bulb at the end. It is it's all that seven wires opened up and created a bond. That will hold about 55 to 60% of the stressing force. And then the rest, we will do it as a bare strand, which carries about 40 to 45% of the force. So therefore, it's about a meter max. So that uh, meter area, we need to compensate with the reinforcement. Normally, it's done by the edge reinforcement. Then once done, you will set for your profiles. So this is that nowadays we use a bottom mesh everywhere. And then the, you can either, you can schedule the shear, you can leave the chairs on top of the bottom mesh so that you are not going to see anything underside. So it's like a, a, a staple free installation at the bottom. Or you can use it directly on the deck so that you can see it at the end. So maybe you can mark it up that tent and it may be useful for the future. There are plastic chairs available or steel chairs available. It depends what you want to use it. You can use it on the, on the, on the uh, steel chairs at the tip. They will have a plastic coating. It's like a heat-treated coating so that you wouldn't get any uh, corrosion or water into it from the, uh, from the soft of the slab. Then once done, you, we have to install the grout tubes for bonded tendon uh, to grout it later. So it's a live end, one at the live end, and one would be at the dead end. But if you have multiple high points, multiple spans, like four or five spans, then you may end up putting at high points as well. Especially on the beams, you will put every high points, those uh, uh, ducts, uh, so those tubes for the grouting. And uh, one of the things we need to make, you use the denso tape, which is a bit sticky, so that we can prevent any mold or concrete is going into it. That's all the installation. Then after that, the concrete would be cast, and you will reach to a certain uh, uh, certain time to uh, stress it. So you, we will pick up the stressing on the next one. Uh, that when we do the stressing, normally it's, 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 it's advisable to stress it, put up stress next day, or say in uh, 10 to 12 hours, because the post-tensioning slabs uh, not to have, normally they don't have any top reinforcement. Therefore, uh, it's prone to, the, due to the hydration, uh, you might be seeing that early string gauge cracks on top of it. So to avoid that, those early string gauge cracks, the next day you stress it a certain amount of uh, stressing force. So the next day, but this is how the anchor will uh, look like. You will have a polyform, about 100 millimeter polyform in front, because that's the area. You will put your block and you will stress the strand. Then you need to cut it over there. You have to leave about 25 or whatever you are fire rating or cover requirements as a, a, a non-steel uh, non, uh, material, like normally you use uh, porous material, like a, a cement and sand uh, mixture, you will use it. Uh, so you will clean up your, uh, clean up your uh, 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 all the polyforms. Then you will see that the hole over there, and then you will install the blocks, and then the wedges. Wedges can be two parts or three parts. This is a conical shaped one, so that when you release the stressing jack, stressing force, it will be locked in. Uh, so that's need to be uh, cleaned up and installed uh, manually first. Then before uh, stressing up. We need to, the only way we are, try, we are checking on site, our design force is achieved or transferred into the slab is by measuring, uh, extending, uh, measure, measuring the extension of the strands after you stress. So there, we can calculate theoretically how much it should extend for that applied particular load for that particular length and the, and the specified profiles. And then you apply the load and so ask them to measure it, and then you check against the theoretical value. If that is within a certain region, you accept as a designer, we will say, yes, that's done, and that's acceptable. So for that, the datum, you, you do a, a, a painting, you put it up a paint on top of the anchor. This is at the face. This is on top of the slab. We call it pans. So you will uh, mark it, and then we will put on the stressing. 
the first thing, we need to have a warning sign because we are talking about really a high load, about each strand, about 220 to 230 kilonewton, which is really, really heavy. The four strand, if you have, we are talking about 800 to 900 kilonewton, which, which is extremely uh, high load. So that the warning sign need to be placed. Then, if, then the other one is we have to take into account of the stressing sequence, even the four strand we have, it's not advisable to stress from straight away from one side to other side. We need to have a balanced approach onto the balanced force into the slab. Otherwise, there will be a differential force applied against the anchor, so it's not really good for the anchor as well as the slab. So you will use a sequence, put a load on the second one, then go back on here, then go back on that side. Therefore, by doing that, you are reducing the loss of your stressing force at the overall in the slab as well as we are avoiding any imbalance load onto the anchor block or anchor. Uh, this is at the slab edge, you will use a straight jack on it. This is the pants, you will use a curved nose to otherwise is uh, you can't really put just straight jack. So when you have when you when we design, if we are designing a pan, then we need to take into account of the additional losses is going to come from the curved one. Say if you are doing a straight one, if you stress that 80% on the design, you consider 80%. But when you are doing the pants, maybe advisable to consider say only about 70% of the force for your theoretical reasons for your uh, performance of the slab. But on side, you ask them to stress it 80%, so that extra 10% would be taken by this curved element. And uh, you will have you will stress it. You better to have a, you don't really stay behind the uh, stressing area. So as I said, the first you will put the next day a, a, a percentage of the force, that is we call it initial stressing to avoid early string gauge crack, as well as we wanted to remove any pans if we are putting on top of it or polyforms over there. Then in when, when the concrete reaches, say about 25 Newton strength, you will put your remainder of the force and check the extension at the end of it. Uh, then the, the, when we do that extension, once you stress, you will see that the elongated part, you measure it and get the engineer to check it and ask him to once you get the approval, you cut this one. So when you cut it, you will, you will leave about from the edge to the first strand surface at least 20, whatever your cover requirements, but normally about 25 to 30 millimeters. Then you will fill it with the uh, uh, sand and cement uh, material just a bit mixture of it. This is the pants, it looks like this, and you fill it uh, possibly with the concrete. Then the last one, once we have done all those things, you will uh, give them the permission to strike the formwork. That means our, we have stressed it, it's already taking the self weight of the load, and they can strike the formwork. And then according to the back propping design, you, you will suggest them how many legs and where to put it up. So this is the final stage of after stressing. Once done, the last part would be grouting the tendons. So we will follow through a few procedures. Uh, and, and then the first one, uh, you will go and check all the tubes, whether the tubes are, are in a good condition or not. If not, you will repair it. Very likely, most of the time, when the people moves around it with the foam work or something, many ducts would be uh, damaged. So, so you will use a connector and make sure you are getting the uh, 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 tube connected again. Uh, then. The, the immediately the next one will be you will do it uh, uh, air testing using a high pressured air you will insert from one side and it will come out from the other side which allows you to re remove any trapped water or any debris inside the duct so it is a very high pressured uh, air so that you can see that the water will come out then once done, then you will uh, go into the uh, grout. You are preparing, getting pre ready for the preparing the uh, grouting. Uh, early days, the grouting was done. Early days, when I say about 10 years before, we, we normally get the cement and water and then some additives to get that cured and mix it up on site and then pump it. But due to there are some problems because uh, sometimes if, if, you make, if you've made a mistake on the water content or anything, it become like a slurry all the time. It may not set at all. So to prevent all that, the uh, industry finally uh, come to a conclusion that we need a pre-backed grout. So now we have a pre-backed grout it, it's only, the, interestingly, only one manufacturer in the country. That's the only single person. Everybody need to go and buy it. Uh, Parex Grout. So that product, it comes within a bag. 
and it tells you a certain amount of water, say 70 liters for 10 bags, mix it, that's it, and there is a four minutes mixing and then pump it. So you have to, uh, first you have to make sure on your cistern on top of the grout pump, you, you put a 70 liters manual water and just adjust that level to make sure, it's like a calibration, you will do it. Once done, before you mix the grout and everything, you get ready for the testing. This is the, uh, the first one is on the stressing. We are doing the extension. So that is as a designer, we are confident, yes, that our design force is transferred. The second one now, for the durability reasons and the performance of bonded system, bonded design to satisfying the bonded design, all the ducts to be grouted, all void to be grouted. So to prove that we are to do, that's grouted, we are to do a lot more testing. Uh, there, there, there will be a few tests, a safe test we call, and then there is a cube test. We will do it for 28 days and 56 days. Then we will have a, a, a safe, uh, the fluidity test, and then there is a test called the WIC test. Uh, so there, there, there are uh, parameters to satisfy. There are some tests you need to do before grouting, and you need to check on these parameters, whether it's satisfying or not. If yes, you continue to grout. If not, you have to abandon it and prepare a new grout. So the first, you will, this is the pre bag grout. It comes in a uh, all, all, every detail is on there. Even interestingly, there are some expiry dates as well. So you have to use that one within time and 10 bags and put it up and one. And then uh, uh, you will mix it. Once you mix it for the certain time, the four minutes you know, is, is specified. Then on top of a, a cone, you will uh, test with the, uh, uh, this is a BSE and approved and a specified sieve. The sizes, every, everything is limited. So you had to put that one uh, a certain amount, about a liter of the grout, and see is there anything anything trapped or not. If nothing is trapped, it's good to go ahead. Then the second one, we need to do a, a fluidity test, which is basically a certain amount of uh, grout should flow through a cone, and the time you had to look at it, and that time should be there is a certain d duration is there. That means this allows the, fl fluid, the, the, fl the, the workability as well as there, the, it will set for the strength and all the, all the fluid will be set within that specified days. Then the, this is another test called wick testing. This is basically what we are doing is we uh, cast into a tube, put a strand and put the grout to a certain height and check how much is bleed on the next day. I, to be frank, it is an irrelevant test because while you check next day, the grout is already in the slab and the duct. There's no way you can take it out. So this is, but still it's there, but this is maybe more, more relevant when we use that, the, uh, the, uh, the mixing of the cement and uh, cement water and also the additives manually. E even on that case, it's once done, it's done. But nowadays, it's a manufacturer requirement. The Parex need to do this one and prove it, but still on site, we do it because it's UK CARES model specification it still shows that. Uh, then, you know, when you grow, grouting, you will put it on the, the nozzle one side and the other side, uh, uh, one person will wait with the bucket. And when, when the grout comes up, he will leave it for a few seconds to flow fully and then use the hand to see whether the consistency achieved or not. Once it's done, they will shout at, uh, she will tell to the person who is at next to the pump. Then he will keep the, then he will fold it like this, but the person pumping the grout, he will still keep pressure for a few seconds so that all that the grout is, uh, 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 pressured and fully done. So once you have done, next day or something, you can grieve it, you can see that this is how that is fully grouted. So this is, at this point, we know the requirement of the bond attendance is satisfied. So these are the procedures, we follow it on a, on a standard PT1, but these are more important, especially when you come onto the high rise buildings. Because when you go on a repeatedly on the same team would be on site, and when you are doing 60 floors of the one, they will think they are doing right and every time, but there are possibilities, you know, they miss it. And in the grouting, if you look at it, if any, when you have the a perimeter grout tube, in case if the person is not really correctly looking at or something, it could flow outside and it may be a hazard at the end or it may damage the lower cladding. Uh, so especially on the high rise building, all that uh, stages are quite important. Now I try to go to pick up three projects, to, it's two with WSP, one of it he has already shown, and one of the another job with another one, just to give you some of the problems we face on site and how we are going to do it. This is one of the projects at the Bishop's Gate. 
Uh, this is one now. It's a 42-story tower. This is lower floors. It's going to be a commercial few couple of levels, and then a five-star hotel to 19 stories, and then a residential to the roof. Uh, so by looking at this, you can see the all three areas is a cantilever, uh, it's a slab without a vertical obstructing element. So this is about five plus meters in each side, this is about four and a half meters. It's a very large cantilever, uh, action, cantilever slab because this is where the major, the attractive hotel room is going to be. That means they can view from here, as, you know, outside without any obstructions. But that cannot be done, so therefore uh, a vertical element, a stress bar introduced at all these three corners, which is connecting every four levels, and then after that we are transferring into the two levels above, back onto the core. So it's a, from the core through a stress bar in an angle, two levels, and the four levels is connected vertically, that's carrying all over there. Then all these slabs are post-tension, so this, the columns are precast, then at the middle core is a jumped form, and then all the slabs are PT. Now that the first, I will just uh, briefly touch you on the how that the, that outside cantilever, five and a half cantilever is going to be built. It, during the temporary stage, it will be supported. You can see that, that the bars are coming over here. It is the bar is installed four levels, and then this go back onto it. It will be, uh, uh, then, uh, uh, then after that, you know, you will put your cladding and then the structure is going up. However, during the construction, we are not going to have that big bars connected to the core. It would be come from the lowest floor. So during construction stage, we can't, uh, theoretically, sorry, theoretically, we can build that area during construction without any proper support. If you want to leave the full uh, foam work, false work underside, that is not the right approach we wanted to do it in. That's not the smart way to do it. This one is the cost, the second one is obstructions. You can't finish off the following trades, the 42 story. So when you go up, all the trades need to come back from the just a just couple of floors below. So we can't have that. So for that reason, what we have done is on the post tension slab, we have taken out a piece of the corners. So we only decided to cast a certain slabs that means this area, which can self-support on itself with, as a cantilever, and, the, and also it carries a 1.5 kN per meter square construction load. So if you look at here, it's about from the column location, about two and a half meters, here about three meters, which is free to span on its own. So no supports or anything required. But before come and do that, the bar, stress, the cast, stress and bars, they need to cast this one. So when we are, while we are say around 20th floor, they will start off casting this one. At that time, they will have a metal decking underneath with a preformed <laughs> corner one. From that point, they have to support all that four levels. Once they finish, the bar also coming by the side. And until they're connecting the six floors, they need to have some temporary supports underneath to connect it. So that's what is designed for it. And that corner was uh, designed as an RC slab. So a couple of connections over here, then reinforcement provided, because in permanent case, this is a support, is a stress bar will carry. So the one of the design, uh, one of the design uh, we have given, it's not a requirement, but as a designers, as a responsible designers, we offered the client, this bar, if it is collapsed, still the slab will stand. So ultimate, we saved it. We have provided the sufficient reinforcement to stand, but the deflection would be deeper. So safe seeability would be an issue. It's about 100 plus millimeter, 130 millimeter deflection, you will get it, but the slab will still stand. However, if a progressive system, progressive collapse nature, it may not be prevented. But this would be really in case if the bar is caught. The stainless steel bars, however, in case any of the abnormal event, the bars are failed, still the slab will uh, stand at that point. This is the view of one of the view. You can see that now you can see where is the job. It's just in front of this one. So this is just a bottom mesh and the tendons installed. And if you look at it, this is the area I have said, you know, we are casting a cantilever, this is, which is self-supporting cantilever. The props are there because the upper levels are casting on. This is the back prop in design for the wet concrete. This one, if you look at it, one side of the, uh, the installation, this is the aim to show you that 
your anchors is there. We have to have that the, when we go into the construction stage, uh, we have to consider cladding connections, the channels will, would be coming in. And nowadays, and especially on the high rise building, you need to have and self jumping or is a screens, you need to have the protection for the protection at the edge. So you need to have that connection. You need to allow that one. And also you need to have any hoist if you are coming in, the additional connection need to come in. I think I probably, many designers would be here, I really recommend you all please take into account this one when you propose originally, because we are having, keep on having high rise buildings with a very thin slab, but when you started to put it up, practical reasons, you really can't fit in. Like tower crane ties, when all the reinforcement comes in, even the structurally permanent loads works, but during construction, it's extremely difficult. So be careful when, when we take a bit of an attention on those temporary stages. So we, we have coordinated the tendons against the channels, against the screens, and also TC ties, everything. And also one of the things we have here, we have introduced the metal edge shutter. So we, because of the high rise building, mostly the repetitive flows, the angle positions and all, we kept it same. So we formed a, a metal edge shutter with the preformed holes so that anchors can be fitted before even you take that edge piece onto the deck. So it's a very quick and very uniform and very clean. Uh, whereas the traditionally you will have the wooden one, so every time you need to drill it and do it, and normally you, don't, you can't reuse that one again. Then the double height precast columns and the screen. This is the, the generally now, almost all the tall buildings come up with the, the vertical elements are precast, and also now people prefer to cast double height because it will give a, a, about a, a bit of a safe time when you cast the middle floor. So this is connected at the bottom with a shoe connection. The bar is continuous, so it will come up on the top. There is a kind of, kind of a coupler. There's a shoe, take your product, and Langor has their own product, so you can connect it that one. That means a certain bar is continuous, and some of the bars, if, it is, if, the, if your capacity of your load cannot be transferred, you can have a well void, and you can grout it, put a bar inside, and you can grout it. Uh, this is generally when you have the double heights, we may not be able to have any bars coming out. If you come out, that's the deviates the point. So what we do is we try to design this area, like an, if you have an H beam, you will have an H rebar and just go in. We don't need anything need to come out from the column. So the moment, if, if in case if you want to transfer any moment, what we assume is there is a hidden H beam around the perimeter, and then the moment will from the slab will transfer here, and then it will go into and transfer it onto the vertical element. This is the screen I mentioned, you know, we, we will have generally two levels above, and then you will have another two levels underneath, which is support, which is the load transferring, which is quite heavy load. So when we have the high rise building, especially because of the thin slab nature uh, to save that extra flow, the screen loads really substantial impact on it. If we have the edge spans, this is about five meters, and this is inside about eight and a half to nine meters. So if you have a smaller spans, we beef up the reinforcement into the slab because that will be more beneficial than you do a temporary works arrangement for the screen. So the first preferred option, if you can, just put an edge, beef up the reinforcement to carry that extra load. If not, put the extra back propping or design a temporary works. Assume this is totally as a temporary works load, and put the back props underneath. But when you do that back prop, you need to take into account if the edges, whether cantilevered edges or the supported edges. If you haven't cantilevered edges, you will end up uh, un unexpected deflections at the bottom if you are not really propping correctly or, or unwinding the props. That means you need to let the slab to deflect first before you put the props. That is one of the things. Then the, uh, the back propping. This is back propping design is really crucial because it's, uh, we have uh, the back propping design and needs to understand where that back props are going. Don't just look at when you have a multiple flows on it, just one flow and once done, that's it. No, it's I think better to look at from the entire frame, from the ground to the top, so where you are going to end up the last back propping leg. If you have a five levels, the fifth level, what's the nature <laughs> of that? either cantilevered or any problems over there, and you need to advise the contractor correctly whether you need to, you need to unwind, the, you, need, you need to remove, relax the prop first or, 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 or 
whatever or you need to do any any uh, any uh, screws more so that you can apply some compression because otherwise as i said you will end up with an unexpected deflection issues uh, then this is done. This particular job, there are four, th first three levels need to be the featured columns of concrete feature. This is, I tried to, I wanted to show that even though they are building a five star hotel and everything, but still concrete is really fascinating. The client wants to just see the exposed concrete columns at the front for about total actual height is five level. So slab, he doesn't want to see, he wants to see that the circular one. So we all done the design with the cobalt connection. This is very interesting design. This is a post tension slab, but it's connecting, but it's nothing to do with the angle slow. Uh, that we, have, we have seen some of the previous one, you know, uh, that the half joint details, and it, it is properly done and all. <laughs> then I just move on to the second project. This is, you might be seeing this one, just when you come out from the Canary Wharf stations, you can see that this is a 50, that 58 story tower. This is what Diego touched up earlier. This is the mega frame outside and the internal floors inside. So the every, uh, this is the mega flip. You can see that this nodal point, we had a, a, a precast slab with the uh, steel element on top of it. Then the middle, the post tension slabs comes up. And this is the connecting area. As someone will ask, I believe, at the end, how the shortening taken up. This is like a very minimal reinforcement provided through the columns for the uh, uh, disproportionate collapse reasons, and the rest would be the slab would be sliding onto it. So this is the mega floor, and the others are uh, uh, the intermediate floors. This is a view of the mega floor. This is the only two columns internally. All others is parameters. And this is the PT flow while you install. This is so you will have a full level of uh, gap before you come out. And then this is the after that you, they have the client uh, uh, decided to paint the uh, tendon line so that in future any any uh, any drilling or post hole or fixing can be done. Uh, so this is you can see that again the uh, sorry the. Screens and one of the, uh, uh, the this is the hoist is got up, and this is the tower crane ties again. So if you look at from the top, this is the tower crane. We have few levels of ties, so this need to take into account into it. This is kind of the fixing with the with the McCloy bar th bar through it, uh, and then some of the cases we stress even that bars to take that uh, strength onto it. And this is the screen. So this is in this particular job is run slightly differently one for the quicker one and you know they will cast it's a two post so the first post they will do like this with a hoist which carries the materials and this is again another small hoist which is transferred up and down so when we do these uh, uh, screen designs we need to take into account of the deflections uh, and then this is another job another one near canary wharf this is if this is if this is a uh, wood wharf actually area. When you come out from the river, you will see this is, this is going to be the entrance to that. This is a 60 story tower. Up to level nine, it is a perfect circle building with the columns almost closer to the edge. So no problem at all, just a traditional RC slab. But once come out from the level 10, the slab is sticking out. It's cantilevering out all sides so that you can see that it's a very different, so that the, Cladding would be like a glazed element so that it prevents, uh, one is the aesthetic, the second one is it, it prevents the open view from outside. It's a full glaze, so that is a, it's a, a zigzag arrangement. They are going to do it. So this area is all cantilevering out. The traditional slab can't work, so it's a post-tension coming. You can see that the post-tension uh, marking underneath. Uh, here, if you look at the backdropping on top of it, these are the things I just tried to mention take care of it when you do the back propping. Here we had a bottom beam, we put it, we transfer the load into the element, so we have a, at the soffit, we have a horizontal beam, steel beam, which is taking the transfer, uh, the back propping load onto it. Uh, so yeah, you can see that this is under, in, on top of it we have, so this is another view of it. Uh, uh, this is from there, so you can see that the kind of quite a long cantilever is. Uh, and then this one, uh, again, as I said, the, uh, the uh, these tower crane ties, this is the talking is at the surface, so we, we couldn't take that one into the core, so at, this, at the concrete uh, surface we put it up, but we put the bars into it and torqued it to get to carry that load. 
so when we do that, the, uh, the high-rise building on the uh, constructability, need to consider the cladding connections and additional services. We need to consider cladding connections, cranes, uh, and also the plumbing holes and any additional penetrations you have to look at. Then normally you will have the plumbing holes, temporary works plumbing holes, you will have it. The concrete boom, no, you can't cast just any other method, so you will have a concrete boom, will go through one of your slab through one of the holes, so you have to cater for that load. So when you design like a 200 thick slab or something, just take into account where we can put those things. And also the, we will end up the gullies or any other element. So the deflections and uh, all those things need to be taken into account. That's all my presentation, and, and uh, hopefully you get something. And I welcome any questions.